don't want any singing noises here. Uh, welcome this afternoon. Um, happy to be able to open uh, this conference. Uh, right. I uh, forgot to change one thing in this slide, but I won't tell you which bits, so you won't notice. Uh, the date is correct. I will be talking about geolocations and maps. I will uh, try to speak loud and clear, but in case you can't hear me or I'm difficult to understand, please let me know. And if you have any questions during the talk, that's fine as well. Um, right, so let's get started. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm Derek. Um, I live in London, but I'm Dutch. So my English isn't proper English. Uh, I've been doing PHP for about 11 years, 12 years. I lost count. It's been a long, long time. I've written many, many extensions, uh, which I do now as a, as a job, actually, which is quite good. And uh, the whole mapping and geolocation stuff is a bit of a hobby. It is no work. Uh, I just like maps, really. So maps is actually quite, quite difficult to get in the first place. So I'll start with a little bit of theory, uh, and then we'll show lots of, lots of things you can do with maps. It actually involves very little PHP, so that's maybe why this is a nice opening presentation. Um, so yes, to, to make a map, you have to think of a couple of things. And first of all, you need to figure out that um, yeah, the Earth is actually not a sphere. Um, it looks like one from very far away, but if you uh, well, show the differences to a sphere a bit larger, you get something like a pair. Except that won't be very tasty, and it won't have a stem, of course, but uh, the general shape is that of a pear. It has a little bit of indentations in the top, and is a bit flatter than it is wide. Uh, and yeah, to approximate this, to figure out where things are all on the Earth, you need to have an approximation of this shape as a sphere, or in this case, as a geoid, which is a flattened sphere. So if you have an oval, and then round. I'm not sure how to explain it any better. So in order to make these approximations from the shape of the Earth to a ellipsoid is something that is called a reference ellipsoid or called a datum or also called a geodetic system. And this is specified, the way how this is specified is you have the radius of the Earth and then a flattening constant, how flat, how much squished it is. Now, it's not only that, it's also slightly different positions for the center that are different, because if you have to approximate this to make the best possible map for the UK, it will be different than the best, best approximal shape for Poland, for example, or the US, or for the whole world. And every different best projection has a different datum. Now, there's two that are majorly in use, at least uh, in Europe, as far as I know, it's WGS84, which is GPS. Um, most mapping things on, on the internet are done with this data. So this is something we primarily have to deal with. If you live in the UK, every map that you'll buy will be done in a different data. Uh, it's called OSGB36. And this is actually what got me started investigating all this mapping stuff, because I found some interesting things. Like, I went to the Greenwich Observatory, as you all know, Greenwich is the zero meridian. So when they st stand on the line, the nice brass line that you have to pay a quid for, um, and figure out that I looked at my GPS and it didn't say zero. Very annoyingly, it said about, it's, uh, I think it said zero, 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 one something. And then that was weird. So then I started reading up on this and figured out that the Greenwich mer meridian is not the same as GPS uses, because the Greenwich Meridian is based on the UK-based mapping system, which is different from GPS. So I was confused by that. And um, then I read more and more about it and figured out that it's not, so the lines that you can see is about the difference between the Greenwich Meridian and the normal, and the GPS one, which is about 180 meters. Now, if you look at that at different distances, the, the difference become larger between latitude and longitude and, and no, north and south and east and west. And, yeah, th that gets com complicated. So in order to do something with data get published in specific countries, you have to convert that to something that the GPS system uses because that's what all the map systems on the internet use, really. All right, so once we have figured out a coordinate system, we have found a meridian and the approximation of the sphere, then we need to start projecting this to a flat surface because 
it's difficult to represent a sphere on the screen because the screen is flat and on the sphere, right? And there's different, many different map projections in use for that. There's um, the top left is a really, really old map of the Mediterranean. If you, you can go visit this in, uh, in London as a museum and you'll find out that everything you see on that map is absolutely not, makes no sense. Like the Mediterranean looks like, like a weird scrib scribbly line, so that makes no sense. But the bottom two projections, now on the, the bottom left is a bit difficult to see, is a map that shows, um, it's not centered on, on Greenwich, it's centered on somewhere in, I think it's centered in Australia or New Zealand or something like that. And the interesting one about that is that it shows Greenland is about the size of Africa. I'm not sure have, if you know anything about relative size there, but Greenland is not nearly as large as Africa is. So the projections are quite, can, can, different projections are there for different causes or different reasons. Um, the one on the top, uh, bottom left is what most internet-based mapping systems use, whereas the one on the right top shows the area of places very well. And again, it's difficult to see because I can point my mouse pointer at it. You have Greenland is about the length of my mouse pointer up there, whereas you can see in Africa, it's quite a bit larger than that. So different map projections provide you with different information. Again, the internet uses all uh, the bottom left one where it goes from 180 degrees to 180 degrees east-west, but north and south, the only thing it can show you is from about plus 85 to minus 85. Now, showing a map after we have figured out uh, how we want to do that and how we want to projecting is not very difficult to do. How many of you have played with Google Maps or have embedded that in some sites? Always, oh, man. You need to raise your hand as high as you can, otherwise you can't see them there. Need some participating this afternoon. All right, so Google Maps is, shows something like this, right? Sadly, the contrast is not nearly as good as I hoped, so you can't actually see the building in the middle. Uh, it shows you the National, uh, uh, National Museum in London. Um, of course, you can also show the satellite format, right? That should be better to see. But we're thinking about maps, so let's show the maps. Uh, Google Maps is something that many people have used, and embedding that is, okay, I can click in the map and then go next. Embedding, making this, the previous slide is an HTML slide, is basically doing something like this. Um, you have uh, some HTML markup, and then you have a very small bit of JavaScript, which you can see here, um, which get run every time somebody loads a page because this function gets executed on, on load. And it does a few things. It creates a new Google Maps latitude longitude point, the exact center of my map, and then it gives a few options. There's the zoom level. The zoom level tells you how far zoomed in on the map you are. So at zoom level zero, the whole map, the whole world fits in one map tile. And a map tile is 256 by 256 pixels. Zoom level one is four times the size because you double it both east, west, as well as the north, south. So zoom level 17 is, if you calculate the number of tiles on that, it's two to the 17, no, it's four to the 17, which is a lot. So I don't remember the number anymore. I think it's something like four billion. Um, so the further zoom you in, the more tiles you need. Now, it also sets the center to the latitude and longitude and the point that I've created, as well as the type. You can have road map and satellite map and a few of those. And then with the last call in here, var map equals new blah, 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 then links the map to your uh, diff on the side, as you can see here in this one in the second to last line here. Well, there's a few other different um, date, uh, mapping systems out there that also can provide you with maps. And Google Maps can be quite restrictive on how you can use it. Um, they, you will soon probably see advertisements showing up on your maps that you've embedded in your site and stuff like that. So there's a few alternatives. And the one I'm showing here is from OpenStreetMap. How many of you are familiar with OpenStreetMap or, or, or have heard of it? If any of you contributed to OpenStreetMap at all. No? A little bit? Have you added post boxes yet? <laughs> no? I'm just making a joke. Yeah. That's fine. There's a bit of a joke that people starting with OpenStreetMap, the first thing that they do is add post boxes. It, just, it might be a UK thing. The second thing, however, is adding pubs to the map, which is actually very useful. 
Um, okay, this is OpenStreetMap showing in London, and the basics are the same. Uh, it's the same projection that uses the same zoom levels and everything is basically the same, except that the data uh, is actually freely accessible. Adding, there's different ways how you can embed maps. Um, so I'm showing you OpenStreetMap with a tool called Open Layers. And Open Layers will also allow you to have uh, the Google-based maps on there as well. As you can see, the script is a bit larger to do that. First of all, I've added a little bit more markup to make it look better. But um, the main thing comes here again. We have the latitude and longitude and zoom level, which I've said exactly the same as the previous slide. And then this bunch of code gets run whenever the page has done loading. So first of all, we add some controls. By, by default, the open layers library doesn't show any control, so there's no zoom thingy or a little box out where you can select different layers and stuff like that that doesn't do that by default. You also have to set for this library, you have to set a different projection. So although the Google Maps API only supports WGS84, whereas OpenLayers will support many, many different projections. And because this is such a part of the library, you have to keep converting between it all the time, which is a bit of a pain, uh, quite difficult to do. So sometimes, you'll see that everything you render on the map shows exactly 0.0, .0 because you have done con some conversions wrong. It's annoying. But a little bit more powerful. So you see the projection, the display projection showing up a few more times. The projection would be uh, the WGS coordinate system, whereas the display projection would be in pixels. So you have to convert between those to be able to plot things on the map. Right, um, then I'm adding a layer, um, open layers, the name already mentioned that allows you to include different mapping layers. You can add them on top of each other, so you can quite easily put Google Maps maps on top of OpenStreetMap maps, or put in other data in there as well, and they can all have different projections as well. So OpenLayers is very, very powerful, but it's also difficult to use. Um, if you want to do OpenStreetMap, there's a little bit of a, a simpler API, which is called Leaflet. Uh, the controls are very simple here as well. Uh, they work in exactly the same way. You can scroll around and stuff like that. And, uh, zoom in and zoom out. You can see I'm zooming out of London now. And then you see that suddenly the rest of the country is in there. Because I'm not running those tiles of the internet. I'm actually running them locally, which is something that uh, with OpenStreetMap, you can get the whole data and render it yourself, which I've done at home. Put it on my laptop in case there was no sort of internet available here. Luckily, there is some. So that's not a problem now. But, um, yeah, I don't have anything of Poland in here, for example. I, think that's it. I just have London, really. And that's it. All right, so that's Leaflet. Again, this API is, again, very simple because it doesn't try to be powerful. It tries to be Google Maps API, but primarily used for OpenStreetMap data. But you can just as well show uh, Google Maps with that. So the script, is again, is a bit easier. Uh, we just have to create a mapping object, like we do in this line. We set where we can find the tiles, and tiles are the little images that you can put up. If you put in the Google Maps URLs, that will work as well. <laughs> Although you're probably not allowed to doing it, but you can. Um, and then again, we set the latitude and longitude point and the zoom level. Again, it's a bit different. And the var pop up thing, ignore that because you don't need it here. <coughs> so those are the different three libraries that I'm aware of. Um, Yahoo Maps also used to have their own mapping API, but they deprecated that now in, in favor of no Nokia's map, and I have not had the time of looking in their li uh, mapping library to see what that is. Okay, next slide. So besides just showing a map, there's many other things you can do as well, and most of those things are implemented as web services. So looking up the latitude and longitude of a location, meaning I give this API a city name as well as a country name, and then I hope it gives me back the coordinates. That can be a bit difficult sometimes because there's sometimes the same city name has been used multiple times in the country. Uh, the Norwegian city, or it's also the shortest city name as, as far as I know, exists in like five different counties. Um, depending on the mapping API, you can also supply city name, county, or province. I'm not sure how you call those things in Poland here. And then uh, country names. So you can provide all that information to get a better match. So what I've done here, I put in Kielce, comma, Poland, and then it figured out that it's here on this map. 
right? So executing that is actually not more than requesting a URL. So the PHP code for this is very simple. You do, however, need to make sure that your URL encodes uh, the string that, that you're putting in. So what the script basically does, it grabs the URL, nomina.tim.openstreetmap.org slash search question mark format equals JSON. You can also get XML out of that if you want. And then I just put in the city name. And then you get back coordinates. So you get a little bit more back than just coordinates. You um, get back the center. You get back a bounding box. And a bounding box is basically a big square around the thing that you just looked up. So if you look out for city, you'll probably get a large bounding box. If you look for a specific address, you get a tiny bit back. Even though the center of both those things can be the same, of course. It also gives you back a full display name. So this says Kielce, and I'm not going to attempt pronouncing that one. <laughs> I'll leave that exercise to you. I have no, also no idea what the 25001 is, postcode? Postcodes? Uh, well, Polskis, I can guess, and Europe, of course, I understand as well. Uh, the part behind the city name is, in this case, is that the name of the province? Or how can you ask? County. is OK, county, yes. Um, I have no idea why the postcode is in there. That makes not much sense to me. But sometimes, what it returns doesn't always make sense to me. You can actually configure the service quite well. I just haven't added all the arguments into the uh, st search string. So nominatim is part of OpenStreetMap project. It's something you can set up yourself quite easily. Uh, well, quite easily, you need to have a lot of disk space. But besides having a lot of disk space, it's not very difficult to set this up yourself because you can download the whole planet in a phone. It's only 18 gigabytes, so you need to have a slightly fast line. But if you download it, you actually get to set up all the OpenStreetMap servers yourself, which is quite good. It's not something that, uh, because both, most mapping APIs, they will, they will restrict you how many different requests you can make. Like Google has, I don't exactly know the numbers, but you can't make more than 1,000 geolocation requests per day, for example, which you're, which you're querying. OpenStreetMap, the nominative service says you can't really make more than one a second or something like that. Now, if you have a, hard, a larger throughput than that, if you need more, which sometimes makes sense, right, then in this case, you can just download the whole data set and do it yourself. Um, OpenStreetMap used to run their own service for this uh, geolocation, but they now use uh, MapQuest's APIs. MapQuest is using a lot of OpenStreetMap data, and they, have, they host now the search engine for looking up names, which is quite nice of them, and they know how to scale. Uh, they have a couple of servers running the service. It's quite nice. So there's, two, there's three different services. I, I'm not including Google here because the Google Terms of service say that you can't do it, so I'm not including it here. Uh, but nominatim is something from OpenStream, you can set it up yourself. Yeah, who has a, um, a geolocation API as well called Geocode? But I think this is one they're not discontinuing, because last time I tried it, it did work after the discontinuation date. Uh, they tell you that you have to register for an app ID, and then you have to put the app ID here. Well, if you fill in this URL, including the bracket saying your app ID here, it will actually work. So I'm not sure whether I'm actually checking it, but uh, yeah. You can also do the reverse. You can also give the web service a coordinate, and it gives you back a address. So let me try that. If I can find the hotel here on the map. We are Russia. No, not Russia. There about kids. Uh, let's see how in how many clicks I can do that. Three. Four. I was quite good at this early. I, I had a practice run. <laughs> yeah, it's here. It's right here. Ta da! Hey, and it has the hotel name, <laughs> including the address. Um, well, of course, you can go even further than that. You can, if you want to know which mountain top that is, it, it does that too. Or it should do that. Uh, okay, maybe not. Live demos are always like this, right? So this is a different hotel, so if we click on that, it should also say this. Yes. Sometimes the requests take a bit of time, or not. But as you can see, this map quite well. And all of OpenStreetMap's data is actually done by volunteers. So some people staying at this hotel must have gotten really bored and mapped all this stuff. 
so it even has mapped all the all the sports park, which is quite interesting. Anyway, um, there's different services for doing this reverse lookup as well. There's something called GeoNames. GeoNames also gives you a large, large database of every town in the world and under an open license. No, it's not an open license. They just say you can use the data or something like that. Um, each of those three servers that I'm listing here have different strengths. What you can do with Nominatim is depending on the zoom level that you give it, how accurate the address that you get back will be. So if you have a map of the whole world, it doesn't make sense to return information up to the address level because well, the point that you're pointing at is probably a million addresses in, in a city like London, right? So um, you can configure that. Um, and so there's different services for that. And they all work mostly the same. Okay, and something else that's kind of cool is that you can um, use HTML5, how do you call it? Is that the geolocation API in HTML5? The location API or something like that, which pops up something in a browser like this and says share location. So let me share the location. We wait, and it finds Kielce. So what it does, it finds a location where you are at the moment and draws an accuracy circle around that. As you can see, you can't see the circle, but let me zoom out a little bit here. So this is actually using uh, some of Google services that I'm not supposed to use, but I couldn't find any better, so I'm using it anyway. Um, <laughs> depending on whether the Google Street View car has gotten close enough to your access point, it will be able to pinpoint that very well. If I do it from my home location at ho house, it will draw a 20 meter circle exactly around my house, which is quite annoying because it knows this information. The funny thing is when I moved, it didn't take more than three days before they had gotten a new location. Uh, I, I blame my flatmate's Android phone. Yeah. <laughs> so I, if and people turn on the Android phones, phones here and connected to Wi-Fi, I don't think it will take a lot of time before this actually is very accurate as, as opposed to the city of, of right. Um, and for doing that, it's not very, very difficult as well. So where is my, okay, whenever I move the pointer on the map, I call a function called get position. And with get position, I call navigator.geolocation, which is HTML5 geolocation API then called get current position, which you give two callback functions to. The first one gets executed when the browser says yes, allow, or the second one will be executed when either the user says no or don't want it or doesn't know how to do it. Because not, not every browser implements always this information. And there's a timeout of 30 seconds. And in that case, we'll also call, call not the faintest clue, like I don't know where it is. That, f that function is empty, so it would do anything. So it only works in the cases where it does actually find a location for you. And here it does some interesting um, coordinate conversions because it needs to convert between latitude and longitude to the map coordinates. So this is where it calls trans transform with the um, display projection. It means convert to the display projection from the map projection and the map projection is in latitude and longitude. Calculate the center. Um, actually, we set the center and then get the center, which is not very clever. Um, then we calculate a factor, because drawing a circle on a map is not nearly as easy as it seems, because of the projection. Um, the further north you go, the, um, the width of the whole map is still the same width as it's being shown, because it's the same number of degrees. But of course, the further you get to the poles, the smaller the length is because you get closer to the pole and because, yeah, you get closer to the circle top. So if you go all the way north to 19 degrees, the map would still be this wide. But of course, the length will be zero. Um, cutting off your map at 85 degrees north and south fixes that a little bit. But you still, if you want to draw a circle in this map projection, you would have to calculate the difference between the height and the width. And I have some math for that later. So that's what we do with all the multi-feature stuff. We calculate, we basically draw a circle, which is a bit more tricky than it should be. And then it shows it. All right, next slides. Is, uh, oh yeah, Google's geolocation service. You can actually call that yourself as well quite easily. You have to give it a version, which is always 110. You have to give it a host, 
I figured out that if you use example.com, it will just work, but they probably want you to um, use your domain or something like that. And then you have to give it a array of Wi-Fi towers, which you have to give your SSID and your MAC address. The more of those you add, the more accurate the location will be because it will triangulate between those. Um, sometimes that goes wrong. Uh, if you would do this in, in a big port where you have cruise ships coming in, I've had people figuring out that this is not New York when they were just driving past a cruise ship in the Mediterranean because the cruise ship had crossed the ocean and it had picked up the wrong, uh, the wrong access point. So sometimes that doesn't always work and it's not the most accurate then, uh, but most of the time it works. So what this returns is something like this. It shows you the latitude and longitude and the accuracy. For Kielce, the accuracy is um, about 25 kilometers, I think it showed. And it, what it also will return is a access token that Google says you have to use this every time. Well, I'm not using that any time and it still works, but of course my usage is so low. If you want to make use of the services, you really should, buy their, should, really should play by their terms and conditions. Otherwise, I might get upset and shut it off for you. Uh, I'm not aware of any other service that does this that you can just call. Now, a little bit more about OpenStreetMap. Um, I think it's an awesome project. Um, it is, you can describe this as Wikipedia for map data. And I bolded the word data because OpenStreetMap is not about your map tiles. It's not about the rendering or how it looks. It is about the data behind it. And with the data behind it, you can do many other things than just rendering the maps for your website. Um, so even the data that you see is not everything that is part of the database. So um, let's do something with the data in there instead. So what I did uh, at home some time ago, so I wanted to have all, a list of all the pubs in London. Oh no, this is a list of all the pubs in, where is this? Manchester, I think. I think it's in Manchester. Um, a list of all the pubs in Manchester. And you can query the interface called open.mapbus.api.com slash xapi, API 06 node. So what this will do is it queries the OpenStreetMap database. Actually, we're cheating and querying MapQuest OpenStreetMap database, but it's up to date, so that doesn't matter too much. And with nodes, we grab every point that has uh, the category amenities pub. So we've basically fetched all the points that are tagged as a pub in Manchester. And uh, this basically ret returns a big H uh, XML file, which you have a small abstract of uh, below. So the XML file contains nodes, nodes are points, and they are tagged with what it is and names or other things, because OpenStreetMap allows you to tag whatever you want to it. Um, some pubs are very well described. Uh, they tell you there's real ill. If you're English, that is really important. If you're not, then probably not. Um, and you can also see this being tagged with a phone number and a postcode. The M13 bit is a postcode, the names, the address. But of course, all this data is never always shown on the map because it would get too cluttered, right? Now, the data that you get back is, is note, which is points, and you can also get ways and areas. A way is basically a list of nodes, and an area is the same list of nodes, but the first and the last node are the same. So you get a close way, which is then an area. And a way consists then of just references to other nodes, as you can see in the second bit here. And each of those things can have tags associated with it. So you can have house numbers, a street name, what it is, a building, uh, the names of it, postcodes, everything, everything you can think of for roads, could be the number of lanes, where there's a traffic light, where you can park on the road, um, what the, uh, how do you call it? I forgot the name of this. The angle of the road is not the word you use for it, but you probably know what I mean. How steep the road is, there you go. Um, and all those things can be part of that as well. And the cool thing is that you can, of course, process this XML and do something with it. So that's what I did. So I'm using SAPI to fetch the data. I parse the XML with PHP into a database. So I, I parse the list with all the pubs in the XML file into a database, I'm going to query the database, show the data, and we make some profit. In this case, it's not really profit, but pretty images, I hope. 
So let me share the location once more. This is what it would do for London. It shows you quite a few pups in a half kilometer radius. So if we share the location again, it should show Kiltsa. It should show, there we go, it's not the quickest. Now, when I did this earlier for Kiltz, it didn't find any pup. So that's not very useful. So uh, I, I also pulled a list of all the restaurants. So let me change that to all, which then shows all the restaurants and click find. And it finds two restaurants, yay. Now, it finds two, two restaurants in this bits. Let me see, it is a bit slow at the moment there. Find there. Let me select this bit. There's three there, which is not a whole lot. But um, besides restaurants, I also fetch all the hotels in this area. So let me go to a radius of 20 kilometers and center on where we are, which is this one. And you see that we're in this hotel. So this have, uh, it, it does show up as restaurant because I didn't bother find, creating a new icon for hotel here. But um, this data plotting on a map is actually quite simple to do. So next slide, next slide, next slide. Next slide I said. Sometimes it's being annoying. Next slide, share location, there we go, next one. So the script behind this is not very difficult either. The function change query gets called every time I've changed my mouse pointer again. And then it does a, whole, does a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, setting up a event for the mouse pointer have been moved. You do with a top bit of code. In the initialization for the uh, open layers map thingy, you can set an event list now, which is called move end. So every time you stop moving something, it will call this func function for you. The move end event function, as you can see at the bottom, calls change query, which basically Oh, sorry. Which basically meant that I could have added this function directly into there, but uh, I wanted something between, in case I want to do something more with it. It's not very important. So the, thir the first three lines in this bit of code, they will fetch the input of, all of my three input boxes. It will find the cuisine. In this case, I've set it up in such a way that if you type Chinese, you only get the Chinese restaurants and the Chinese pubs. But I'm not sure if there's such a thing as a Chinese pub. <laughs> There are, however, Thai pubs in London. There are pubs that also serve Thai food, which I find still slightly mind-boggling, but it's how it is. So you have the cuisine, the radius, which is the distance from the center point, and the source. And the source in this case is because I was playing with this. I have a source of SQLite. So I've parsed the data in both SQLite as well as in MongoDB. Uh, just to play with all the different solutions and how to do specific querying, all of that. Again, the, um, the center point needs to be transformed between the different things. With destroy, I just delete everything I already had. And then with new open layer text equals the shops. It creates a new layer and it fetches that from the location dot slash plus the name of the script for each of the different sources. I have a different script. All the, and then the arguments for cuisine the center, latitudes and longitudes, as well as the radius. And this PHP script then queries the database and returns this as a very simple text file, which open layers will understand how to render on the map. So if you go to the, hang on. I thought I had a little list of how to return that, but apparently not. Now, I already mentioned that um, it is tricky to do distances on the map. Because most, it's very easy to calculate the distance in degrees, right? Because you have uh, two different points. And calculating the distance between points you do with something called Pythagoras. I'm sure you guys have heard of Pythagoras. Um, but that calculates the, the distance in degrees. The distance in degrees is not very useful because converting the distance in degrees to distance in points depends on where on the earth you are. The further north you go, the distance, one degree becomes smaller and smaller. Now, when I was doing some calculations of that, I wanted to draw a circle around London. Uh, I was really quite confused because it would draw a circle that was um, north-south was 
exactly like I wanted, but east-west, it was about zero to 60 percent of it. And that was exactly the radius between miles and kilometers. So I was wondering, what am I doing wrong with that? But then figured out it's actually because there are some calculations behind it that you have to do. This goes back to high school. I'm not sure how, how, how familiar you are with that anymore, but I wasn't at all, so I had to look this up. Um, so the top circle shows you, a, um, if you have the earth, it cuts it through the Greenwich meridian and the dateline, really. So 45 degrees on that is an eighth of the full circle with a radius of 6,300 kilometers, which ends up being calculated as 5,000 kilometers. However, on this height, so that we cut a slice of the earth on the latitude of London, the, the circle is smaller, and the, the, the radius of the circle at that point can be calculated with cosine as 45 degrees. Now, if you then again take 45 degrees, you end up being only 3,500 kilometers. So with those calculations, you, you calculate how to draw, or you know how to draw a circle. Calculating, however, a distance between two points is really quite difficult, but I'll come back to that in a second, I think. So getting the data from SQLi, the data that I've parsed in. So what I want to do is I want to parse in the data and then query back everything and make sure that the distance between the center point and the radius that I gave in will return, uh, will match. Now, SQLi, it's SQL isn't very powerful. So in this case, what I had to do, I had to run a query. As you can see about here, I basically query everything in my database. And then after I've queried everything in the database, I call the function called distance2, that's also distance1, which calculates the distance between those two points, and then filters based on that. So I calculate the distance between the latitudes and longitudes, uh, and then the latitudes and longitudes that and if that is smaller than what I expected, I return something from the script. Now, it returns something like this. It's very simple. It is a tab-separated file that it returns with latitudes, longitudes, the title, the description, and the description is how far it is away in my case. The size of the icon, which is 16 by 16, as well as the offsets and what icon to show. In this case, it's all pups. Um, of course, returning this from a PHP script is really simple. You just have to make sure you format it correctly. Now, SQLite, because it doesn't have a very good SQL interface, it, you can't do the calculations inside the database itself. However, oh yeah, this is the distance to function, which you, you don't have to remember right down. You can just download it from, from the uh, slides later. Now, for my SQL, it's a bit easy because MySQL allows stored procedures. So what I did here is I made a query, <coughs> um, fetch everything, including calling a stored procedure called distance, which again implements the same formula. But in this case, it's a, it's a stored procedure instead of a PHP function. And because I can do this, I, I can do the filtering inside the query itself, it doesn't return all the data. But you still end up having to calculate the distance for every point in your database to your center point, which as you can imagine is quite slow, especially if you're in London and there's 5,000 pups in the database. Um, so uh, there's a few tricks how you can fix that as well. So this, again, the store procedure looks like this, but what you can do, of course, is you, you can first calculate the bounding box around your circle, then do a very simple query with where both latitude and longitude are between something. That is really fast to do in a database. And then everything you get back from there, you just cut off all the bits that are outside your circle. Um, so, which is uh, something I describe on the article you find there. Again, I will put the slides online so you can, don't have to copy the URL. Right, and then, um, okay, I should not have shared the location because there's not enough data. So the, the difference between not calculating the distance yourself with this formula or, uh, or doing it, you can see in, in this bit. So without 
it shows like this, and width it shows like this. So then you get all the pups that are actually in the radius. Now MongoDB, which I use as a backend here, now actually implemented um, a proper filter for calculating distances. My script doesn't quite use that. So every di different database has different solutions for this. MySQL does have geographical functions built in or via an extension, but they tend not to do any calculations based on real distance. They only do things with uh, degrees, which is not very good. PostgreSQL has very good GIS support or geo support, and Mongo no does now as well, and Solar has it, and what's the other one? CouchDB has it as well. So depending on which service you use, you might have to do more calculations or not. So Mongo is very simple. I call, um, in this case, GeoNear. Poi is the name of my database. I say how many things I want returned back and the maximum distance. So I do have to calculate here still between degrees at, or between kilometers and degrees. And uh, yeah, that's not very accurate because it doesn't do the whole circle. But that was um, okay. Yes, I've done that. So another thing that I've done is I pull all my um, my photos from Flickr. I put this on a map as well, so I have a very simple example on how to do that. Again, I parse all the data into my local database first, and then I show that with pretty graphics. So this is something from some time ago. If uh, let, I then click on the pictures, they show up large. So this elephants on the beach. I sadly didn't bring any f elephants with me. Uh, those are PHP elephants, eh? They have the PHP, uh, PHP written on the back. Does anybody bring an elephant? Does any of you have ever seen him? They're, they're not, yeah, yeah, I have a whole box at home, but I forgot to bring an extra one. So, sorry. They're cute though, which is important. Um, so th the code behind this isn't very difficult either. Um, Again, with it, when the chain query is called, that means when I move the thing around, it removes all the markers, then calls a function which returns JSON, as you can see here. This is a bit of JavaScript, it's actually jQuery. Um, calls a function called fetch flicker, which then returns a JSON structure with all the coordinates as well as the URL of the images, which then gets drawn on the map by calling new image markers, which calculates how big it's supposed to be because the further I zoom out, the smaller one the image is to be. Um, so I'll calculate that. Then do some, the same coordinate transformation between latitude and longitude and points, and then show them on the map. And when you click on it, I create a, a function for it, which says show the image with this icon, and show the image will then show the image in the next, um, next diff next door. Yeah, that is basically the things I had to show here. Uh, okay, this is the Flickr script behind it. Again, you can see how simple this is. Most of the interactions between PHP and your database or and maps is fact, having very simple fetch things from your database. Of course, what you can do is at that moment, you can go to Flickr and fetch it at that moment, but I don't find it very working very well. So I, I tend to pull my data first and then display it on the map. All right. Um, this is a list with resources uh, to read up and other things. I will publish my slides on Derek Wetton's on Zanel slash talks. Uh, so far, are there any questions? You know, ask questions. I will ask questions, and there will be difficult questions. <laughs> None? Are you sure you want me to ask questions? Well, even one? Okay. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, if you have any comments, I, I'd still happy to hear them. Uh, as I mentioned, I will put the slides online. The first slide has the same URL to my slides, but it's, uh, yeah, sorry. And it doesn't have my joined in link, yes, which I was hoping for it actually has, but it doesn't. What a shame. Uh, right. Yeah, that's it then. Thank you very much. <laughs>